getting thrown into the international market. But we have to ask the question, how is possible that Chile, 30 years after dictatorship, killing thousands of people, super controlled, highly privatized, the best, most complete neoliberal experiment, Argentina, super, you know, we privatize absolutely everything. There is nothing that wasn't privatized now. Today, Argentina is nationalizing the oil company against, you know, the Spanish private company. So, Brazil, Uruguay, Colombia, Salvador, going to leave Mexico apart because that ruins my colony. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we, we, we exclude the outliers. Finland, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Spain, we have, well, Spain now is again really my argument, but um, <coughs> the question is for me after all these 40 or more than 40 years of systematic attacks, we still have forms of public education forms of uh, resistance, forms of critical consciousness, forms of counter-hegemonic pedagogical practices that are still there and we can see them. So there is something about the space of schools that is different, the space of education, that is different from any other space. And our populations, with more or less degrees of awareness, still perceive education as something special. And that specialness of that space, I think that we need to nurture and preserve more. And that is the type of dialogue that I want to engage with, and people engaging with us in that dialogue. Because it's absolutely incredible. You Seriously, you, you go to a school in Argentina today, and you will be amazed. If you compare with what happened 10 years ago, that you know, what we are talking about, violence in American schools, it's not that it's romantic, but you know, those schools were super violent, with the police inside, without any type of training, with you know, teach for America on asteroids. <laughs> it's like, do you breathe? Yes. Can you smack a kid in the head? Yes, you are a teacher. <laughs> That is super, you know, authoritarian, horrible. Are the schools better today? Can we have these discussions in those schools? Yes. Uh, are teachers occupying schools? Yes. Taking advantage of the privatization of human rights organizations, taking over this kind of, uh, you know, using the language of the corporate model to turn it around and say, okay, you're failing, I will take over your school. So now human rights organizations taking over, you know, failed privatization models. So there is this space where we need really to be a lot more creative in doing this and recognizing those spaces of resistance. I'm going to, <coughs> we have to go there. They are, not coming, they are not coming to us. There is a sense of mistrust that is built. If we don't go, the isolation will continue. Um, let me preface what I'm going to ask by saying two things. I, as an undergraduate, I had a minor in anthropology and so have a fascination with uh, the other place and uh, also was schooled by my grandmother who said charity starts at home. And I think it's really incredibly valuable to have the knowledge of what's happening in Argentina, in Chile, and even in Mexico and Spain, even though they don't fit uh, the same kind of mold easily. That's incredibly informative and helpful for us to think domestically about what we ought to be doing. And uh, we learn from the other context and use that knowledge to solve the problems in our own backyard. Um, 
And Jill, I was kind of surprised at what you said when you say you don't feel you can do this in Wisconsin. No teachers are going to get killed in Wisconsin. Um, it, you know, it's a, it's a different political environment that in some ways has less risk, so much less risk to work in for you as a researcher for the teachers and for students. And yet we romanticize the violence and the um, extreme uh, situation that we see elsewhere and then don't do a very good job of taking the lessons and somehow turning them even in modest ways into helping, asking how we can help in our own backyard. And I think that we need to do that, learn elsewhere and bring the lessons back. And so talk a little bit about why you can't do that in Wisconsin. Oh, I think you misunderstood me. I mean, I think that's exactly what I do in Wisconsin. But the context <coughs> is different. Uh, the approach is different. Because you have, I mean, and, and the project is slightly different. I mean, we're in a different place in Wisconsin. Um, you know, we're also entering into TV. We're also, uh, you've got, you know, in our schools and with our teacher education students and uh, with what we're doing, they're coming in with a very specific cultural vision of what their job is as a teacher, and you need to do a lot of back work to even get to that conversation so that they can recognize that, you know, I mean, it's, it's like one of the conversations that we always have, which always somehow is blows their minds. I'm talking about my teacher education students is, you know, when, when they come to the realization that schools aren't these happy, happy places that, that give students ultimate uh, unlimited opportunities. Some students are <coughs> really opportunities in school, so I don't want to negate that, that issue that schools are kind of special places. But the fact that what their work could do um, actually can marginalize and destroy uh, opportunities. And I don't even like the word opportunity, but you know what I'm saying, you know, for kids. So I think it's not, I, 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 don't, I hope I didn't say I can't do it in Wisconsin, but it's a different context. And it's a different, um, I'm not trying to romanticize either what's happening in Chile, because that's, that would be kind of arrogant and materialistic, um, but it's, 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 the work is different in different places. The project is the same, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But, um, you know, the, the work that I'm doing with undergrads, they have to see, they have to become conscious <coughs> of a problem. Right. And when they, they have to understand their own complicity in this site of oppression that they are part of and that they're going to reproduce. Right. And they need to understand their own position of privilege coming into that space as someone for whom the system has worked really, really well. So why would they see it as problematic in any way? So, so it's just building that critique to begin with, and then you go beyond. And then you say, OK, how can this become a transformative reality? And of course, you can do it in Wisconsin. I mean, that's the job that I do, you know? Um, and of course, you know, we've got our we're about to recall our governor, and we've got all kinds of stuff going on. And I think that has, uh, has been a really beautiful moment to have been able to live through, because where many, many uh, folks, and I mean, I think part of it is just this whole domesticated culture that is the Midwest. And I come from Minnesota originally, and then lived in California for 22 years. So when I came back, I was like, OK, I'm back with my people, you know. <laughs> How can I help to bring what I've learned and create, you know, transformative spaces here? And then I was like, well, my people are pretty messed up. And, and, but, but you don't see it because that is the image of perfection that we buy and sell all over the place. That is the, that is the image of the perfect sort of uh, outcome of the American dream. And so when Walker started all his shenanigans, and people, it became real to everybody that, wait a minute, this is a myth, first of all. And it's a fragile reality. And it doesn't matter what you think, because you can be, you know, you can have a lot of things happen to you, and you need to identify yourself as a social actor. Right. And as someone who can take that agency and go with it and be transformative. And I think uh, uh, teachers and educators and public workers all over the state coming to that realization has, has helped uh, create a space for a much more powerful conversation, you know. So, yeah, I hope that I didn't actually say I can't do it in Wisconsin because that's not what I mean. I, I just mean the contexts are different, and the, the 
you know, where people are coming, how, wh what people are coming to the table with is very different. So. It, can I, can I, sorry. I just wanted to, if I could just briefly chime in, because we've been very unfair to Mexico here. We've, <laughs> we've been very unfair. Uh, Joe mentioned the American dream. A lot of, a lot of people from, from um, uh, America Latina come and ask us, what have you done to make, you know, they're basically looking uh, to us for answers. Um, and, you know, and are they our backyard or should they be, or should we even consider distinctions like our backyard, our space, their space? I think we have to break down those distinctions. But I was in Chihuahua a few years ago and I was teaching a graduate um, seminar uh, in teacher education. And the first thing that happened to me when I walked in the seminar room was I noticed that there were two, two women who had enrolled in my class a crime profusely. And I went over to them and asked them what was wrong. The seminar was just about to begin. And they said, well, you know, we were here in your seminar, professor, because we know that you have the answer for us. And I said, well, why are you crying? And they said, well, we came all the way from Pará to Chihuahua City. And uh, we, we came just very recently, just two days ago. And I said, well, wow, that's a long way to come for the seminar. They said, no, we came here to live. And I said, oh, I know, I know Pará. I've been in Pará, and I know that's where Pancho Villa was assassinated. I know the city. Um, you've come along, you've, you've, you've moved quite a way. They said, no, we had no choice. Los Zetas, Los Zetas approached all the teachers in our city, and they said, you get teachers' salaries, don't you, every month. Turn them over to us. If you don't, we will torture, and we will dismember, we will kill your offspring and your family. Los Zetas, our former, our former special forces from Mexico that have become a drug cartel. They're trained in Fort Benning, Georgia. They've become a drug cartel, very powerful um, uh, drug cartel, one of the most powerful in Mexico. So if you're a teacher, you have to hand over your, te your, your monthly teacher's check, or they will kill you. Your, they will kill your family. So they packed everything they could into their cars, drove to the, my seminar in Chihuahua City, and somehow looked to me as if I'm going to have some kind of answer for them. I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable. Um, last December, about a year and a half ago, I was in Morelia, Michoacan, and I was, we're doing a course on Marx and education, um, and La Familia Michoacana attacked the city. I won't go into all the details, but um, we tried to get out. We couldn't because um, they, they blocked all the exits to the city with flaming passenger buses. For those of us that were trying to get out, and La Familia Michoacana is a powerful drug cartel. And it's the largest methamphetamine sort of supplier in all of America Latina. Um, they weren't attacking us per se, but they, were, they had attacked the city. And um, it was, it's, it's, just, it's just unbelievable um, the, the context in which people are living now in Mexico and what they have to deal with. La Familia Michoacana uses the language of the Mexican Revolution. And they have a lot of teachers who support them because they give out money to, they provide, they, they'll, they'll give loans, to, they'll make loans to teachers. They'll give loans to farmers. And they'll use this language, the Mexican Revolution. And they have a philosophy, by the way, that they've, that they've taken from James Dobson's Focus on the Family. And it's called Family Values. And they tell their drug, their drug pushers, do not take drugs. Taking drugs is bad. You know, and practice family values. They tell this to their drug pushers. And, this is, and, and they get it right from James Dobson. It's a long story. I have the connection, but I won't tell you. So, um, so it's just, and so here are teachers <coughs> handing out literature and propagandizing for La Familia Michoacana when La Familia Michoacana have a philosophy of what they call divine violence. They're the ones that threw, threw six severed heads in the disco floor a few years back in one of the discos, basically saying, uh, all those that we kill deserve to be killed because we are exporting divine violence. So you, this is the and 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 you you have teachers 
um, supported La Familia Michoacana, and teachers divided about the role that La Familia Michoacana is playing. So Mexico is a unique situation. It's right on La Frontera, La, La, La Linea, right, you know, with, with California. And, um, and it's, it's in, in, in what, what is happening there <laughs> needs to be understood needs to be comprehended and I think needs to be part of the, the overall conversation because transna we're talking about the transnational capitalist class. And any kind of solution that we have has to be both local and transnational simultaneously. So we can't avoid, we can't avoid um, these larger questions. We're about out of time. We'll take one more. Fish. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the panelists. My question is specifically inspired by some things that Peter McLaren was talking about, but I'm sure um, any of you, any answer from any of would be awesome. Um, I'm, I'm very excited and interested in pragmatism, and I was very enthusiastic uh, in uh, Dr. McLaren's piece about the practical revolutionary activity, and um, I'm interested in uh, these the connection to a pragmatist, specifically pragmatist conception of ends as these sort of non-material things and, and the relationship of that concept uh, not only to like an anarchist project in, in education but also to um, the, this idea that, that you bring up uh, f like from Jameson and the, the idea of a, a, of a negation of negation and, and a more like a sort of absolute um, uh, this sort of a, a, what am I trying to say? Um, the, this, this absolute, which is no longer dependent upon uh, an external um, object. Um, and is, is that, it was Dewey for perhaps talking about the same thing when he conceptualized uh, ends uh, in such a way as sort of imaginative um, things which you're constantly creating in the absence of any actual physical material um, you know, evidence or, you know, though he was being very rational and di thinking dialectically about these things, about ends, um, he saw them as, as sort of a thing apart. Um, is that, please disagree or agree with me. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the distinction I would make would be between concrete and abstract utopia. Um, and that um, obviously Marx talked about the new obviously growing out of the old in some way. So um, the, the new is given birth within the womb of, of the old. Um, and, uh, but, and, and I think the distinction would be between um, uh, abstract utopia, which would be just, you know, thinking that somehow is disconnected from the material, the contextual specificity of the struggles in which you find yourself. And just, you know, you're just positing some alternative universes out there that really aren't grounded in what's going on in the ground. And a concrete utopia, which is grounded in everyday struggles um, and, and everyday problems. And, and, and so I would make that distinction that we, we have to be utopian thinkers. We, we cannot afford to be otherwise. Um, but that that utopianism needs to be a concrete utopianism that's 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 grounded in 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 in, in, in everyday lived reality. So I guess I would just stop there. Um, I'm not. I mean, pragmatism is interesting. Um, right now I'm. I'm <laughs> yeah. Well, right now I'm. We'll talk at some point, maybe after the after the uh, discussion. But I'm, I'm more interested right now in issues around process, philosophy, and liberation theology. I've just spent the last three weeks with um, Catholic priests in Auckland. Um, and, um, and I'm reading a very interesting book, which I would recommend to everybody, um, and I, you know, by, by someone whom I've critiqued in the past and um, whom I had a five-hour conversation with once. And, and managed to get no words in. Uh, it's a book by Sla, uh, Slavoj Žižek, um, and it's and, 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 and a theologian who's progressive, but much more conservative than Slavoj. Anyway, the book is called The, Monstro the Mon Monstrosity of Christ. And, and, and uh, the theme is basically um, 
of God becoming human. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for this panel, and it's time for the speaker. We'll reconvene in about uh, 15 minutes.